All right, guys, welcome back to the Steel Forum. My name is Nick Coffey. With me, as always, Matt Hand. Today, we're talking about uh, some taxes and a foible in the PPP that might have your riches in a twitch if you're not paying attention. So you'll want to hear that tip. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the SDS2 Summit and why we didn't go. Here's a hint. It's because we forgot. And uh, all that and more coming up today on the Steel Forum. All right, Matt, welcome back. It's been, uh, you know, an interesting time. It's been uh, quiet, right? Like quiet in our world. What about your world? Well, you know, we life's been crazy all summer. We've had uh, houses burning down around us and people shooting off fireworks in residential areas like that's okay to do. And the cops want to care, but they can't care. So... The fireworks thing has been an interesting development, like uh, particularly in New York. It's like people got bored, so they were just like, well, I got nothing to do. Let's go blow some stuff up. Right. And, you know, it, that has that has been so troubling to me because I am the first person to light fireworks that I can get my hands on. But right. it, my whole life, you get your hands on some fireworks you go out in the woods, you go out to a farm field, you go to the lake, you get away from everybody, and you right. shoot that stuff off, you have your fun, and then you go home. People standing six inches from the road and shooting stuff off with mortar shells that are going over other people's houses, and then acting surprised when somebody's house burns down, where did that come from? To be fair... To be fair, uh, some of the houses around you could afford to burn down. Yeah, well, the one that, that around the corner from me that burned down, that was in good shape. That was a good uh, house. Maybe they did it. it. Was, maybe they did it for the insurance money. Uh, I, I've got too much backstory on the people around there. To so th that's one of those things that people say that ends up being ridiculous. Like, oh, maybe they did it for the insurance money. Insurance only is going to pay you what the value of that thing already right. was, right? It's just like the the thing that they say, oh, well, it's a it's a tax write off, so it's like it doesn't, you know, <laughs> exist. It's like no, that I still, still spent that, that money. money. Like, do you not understand how tax write offs yeah. work? Like, I think every business owner in the world thinks that or every non-business owner in the world thinks that a tax write-off just means that the government just gives you that money and it's free now. No, that's that's not how it works. Which actually brings us to our first topic for the day, the PPP and an interesting foible, or, you know, absolutely stick it up the American business owner by the IRS. You want, you want to talk about it a little bit? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm still a little shaken over that. Um, I was going to say, are you willing to talk about it? I, I know you don't want to, but are you still willing? Still fuming after having read the uh, the release from the IRS. So, all of my Alexa devices just went off with something. Uh, right. So, just uh, we, we got an email, and it, it's the kind of email that I normally don't even open. I just... It's it's yeah. it's a, a unsolicited you know somebody's trying to sell me shop equipment essentially, and we're a detailer. Yep. I don't care. So, <clears throat> but it was the title of it that that grabbed me. It, it had something to do with you know, hey, did did you did you get a PPP loan and you're profitable? You might want to check us out for taxes. And I, I was thinking to myself, that's not a selling point because the PPP thing. It's not taxable income. If it's forgiven, it's considered a non-taxable grant. And that's the end of the conversation. So what on earth are you talking about? So I clicked into it and it got me kind of scratching my head and wondering, did something change? And I wasn't aware. So I did a little bit of searching 
and found uh, an accountant's blog website, and they were talking about this uh, memo or, or clarification that was released just the other day by the IRS. Let's stop right there because that term clarification yeah. is such not that's like the architects. Uh, what do they call it? ASI. Uh, so, yes, our Archi- architects supplemental instruction. What I meant to say, which is never. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, it's oh when I meant you know it sloped a quarter on twelve. I meant one foot on twelve. <laughs> it's it's a forty five degree slope. Right. Uh and it's like, no, that's not a supplemental instruction. That's a redesign. And I don't care what letters you put in front of it. If I have to do more work, guess who's writing me a check? <laughs> yeah. So the uh, clarification from the IRS essentially states that, um, well, yes, the, the PPP money, if it is forgiven, and of course, if that's the thing that if. terrifies business owners as well at this point is if, if it is forgiven, the money itself is not considered taxable income. But the expense that you spend it on, and remember, a requirement for forgiveness is that you have to spend it on payroll, rent, utilities, and most of it has to go to payroll for that eight-week period. The expenses that you spent it on, not deductible. So, and then they gave a nice example to kind of clarify that. Let's say you got $100,000 and you spent that on payroll. Now, you've got an extra $100,000, but you spent it on payroll. So, you don't have it anymore because you were required to spend it in order to get the forgiveness. Well, the $100,000 you were given is not taxable. But the $100,000 that you spent it on, you can't write off that expense, which means you have to pay taxes on $100,000 worth of payroll expenses. So if you're a C corporation, and I mean, this will vary based on what your individual corporate structure is, but let's say you're a C corporation, your maximum uh, corporate tax is 21%. So you're going to have a $21,000 tax bill which means your net benefit wasn't $100,000. Now it's $79,000. Right. And it's the same thing. It's exactly the same math. They've just moved the procedure right. as if it was taxable income, which is why I don't think it's going to stand up. Right. The, I think the IRS is full of it because the first thing that it, you take this to court, right? And, and what the courts do is they look at the legislative intent, right? right? And the legislative intent is so clearly to have this be treated like any other grant. Right, exactly. That that it, it, this, this isn't going to... But right now, it is the law of the land. So if, if you've got this money and you can't afford it, right, you got to take that 21% that you might have been anticipating having and putting it aside for taxes because it might not right. be there. It, it could definitely bite you later on. So, I'm, you know, right now, as I understand it, um, first of all, Congress is not happy about this. So it is being addressed in bills that are being proposed right now. But, you know, the next if there's another stimulus bill, if that Heroes Act or whatever goes through, that would be tailored to address that. But, you know, whether or not that passes remains to be seen. But also... There's an accounting organization, and uh, we'll have to post the, the blog link so that we can have that information there. Um, they are challenging that already to say that is not what the intent of Congress was when they passed this. That is just absolutely ridiculous. No, you know, this needs to be overturned. Right. And it is. It's it, and it's almost silly, right? Like it's it's. It's like giving your kid your allowance and then making them them hand you back, you know, 21 cents of it. It's, you know, assuming you give your kid a dollar of allowance, which I think is generous based on, you know, the usefulness of children and their (laughs) willingness to do an effective job at any chore that is assigned to them. See, now that's a minimum wage debate right there. (laughs) Anyways... 
<laughs> so there's that, you know, I, I, one of my questions overall it was just kind of how many detailing firms had the wherewithal to go and get that PPP money because detailing firms, there's like this huge gap and we talk about it all the time between what we call the, the basement detailers and then detailing firms where, you know, they've got accounting, they've got payroll, they've got all of these things where it's, you know, it's not just a couple of guys and, um, you know, the accounting is how much, how much money do we have in the banking, in the checking account, right? Like, right. So they, they might not have had the presence of mind or the uh, logistical abilities to go and get that money. I hope they did because, right. you know. Well, for, you know, an, an, another to thing down. to consider, too, is uh, the initial availability. Because I know in speaking with our banker early on, there was a massive wave of people that tried to get it. And she was telling me, uh, and the branch manager and I were talking, and she said, you know, uh, there's a lot of these local businesses that are hemming and hawing over it. Like, do I really need it? Should I apply? I don't know. Do, you know, and, and they kind of pitched it back and forth. And they waited three days. Three days is all they waited. And they said, you know what? I'm going to go for it. Three days later, they go into the bank and they go to, to sign up for it. And they're like, nope, SBA is out of money. We're done here. Sorry. Well, and it's funny, too, because... You had to see it coming. Like, we read the details of the bill, you and I together, right? right? And it took literal back of the napkin math to say <laughs> yes. the amount of money that they have assigned to this is ridiculously low. It's not enough. Like, how many small businesses are there? Right. What's their average payroll times this divide by this and way not enough money? Yep. And... I mean, that's the kind of competence that you can expect out of Congress. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> uh, but you you would hope for more. You would hope for more. It's, you would hope for it's, math It's just skills. like the discussion. Well, it's the same discussion we have about architects and licensed engineers all the time. You, you would hope for better, right. but you expect just this level of math. Right, right. And uh, I think that... Is a really good segue to our uh, brief discussion on SDS two and the the summit, right? Hoping hoping for better, but expecting better. Now, no. did you did you get a chance to watch any of that stuff? Because I did uh, not. We have failed our audience in a a, a giant way, right? Like, because what we did is we set it up, we set you know Jason up, we said okay record these so that we can go back and watch them because the pace of these things tends to drive us crazy with our ADD. Right. Right. Like we're just like, Ugh. so we'll, we'll record it and then we'll just play it back on two X speed. Right. And, 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 and glean the good stuff out of it. Well, what happened was that, uh, the recording software didn't pick up the audio. So oh. it's just, <laughs> it's just two hours of, you know, here's the new, what the new UI and UE looks like, but no explanation behind any of it. And I'll say this, it looks good, right? We we, we desperately needed and wanted a, a UI and UE improvement. And in the forums, the, the reaction has been good. It was like, finally, right? Like make the software less ugly, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, although, you know, Every time I say the software is ugly, somebody from SDS2 sends me a, you know, nasty text message that says, stop calling our software ugly. But apparently it worked, right? Like <laughs> they're, they're tired of hearing it. And not just from us, right? Like it's, it really is. It's, it was, it was bad and it, it can't be good from a sales perspective either. I'm sure their sales team says, listen, that the, the software doesn't look like a modern interface. So it's, you know, it's damaging. Uh, but beyond the UI, and I, I, I don't want to undersell the UI because it looks good and it's it's important. The the user experience is crucial too. Just as a simple thing, one of the things that we did pick up right is they're adding a search function to the settings, which you know kind of our favorite game in the world is find <laughs> that setting. No, that you know, game's gonna like, end now. I, I 
well, it's a good thing. Optimistically, that game will end, right? Like, yeah. right? Because if the search works like the search and help works, it's not going to go well. Then the then it's game <laughs> on. If you search, right? If you like, you're trying to change a bolt grade. You go into the help function. You search for bolt grade, and you get twelve thousand <laughs> hits for a bolt grade. It's like, uh, okay, I guess I'll try the, the the index, which actually works a lot better, and that's the way to go. Right. Yeah, I, I never uh, get so, everything like, by the index. Well, and our entire generation is just completely obsessed with search, right? right? Like, that's just the thing that I do. You just start typing and you think Google's going to fill it in the rest for you. And You it, know, I, I got to stop you there because this reminds me of something that happened last night at dinner. We, we were all sitting around uh, talking and my middle child made this deeply profound statement and i mean she wasn't talking to anyone she just said this out loud and she because she's thinking about you know going to be starting up school again soon and she was looking over some of the subject matter and some of the curriculum and she said why on earth are they bothering to teach us things that we could look up on google it this is a really tough conversation (laughs) And I'll tell you, uh, p- particularly for me, because my wife is a teacher, my sisters are teachers, and I'm kind of a math nerd, especially with mental math, right? Like, and for me, it has been great, you know, a great tool because we do a lot of mental math sure. uh, to the point where it is faster for you to call me and just rattle off the numbers yep. and let me add them up for mm-hmm. you than it is to pull out your calculator. Um. And people go on and on. And there's a guy I know, Chris Riley, right, is is one of these people because he was I, I guarantee you he's had this conversation with with somebody in the past is, oh, kids can't do mental math anymore. We don't teach them that. And oh, the new math. Right. What do they call it? Common, common core, core. Right. They sure. always they, they jump up and down on common core. And you and I both know because you do mental math too. common core is the way that your brain works when it does mental math. The algorithm, right, the the longhand way that we were taught in school to do it, is fantastic if you're writing down the math on paper. However, if you're doing it in your head, the common core way is the right way to do it and what your brain naturally does. Right. this has always been a weird one for me whenever anything has been discussed about common core because to me honestly i don't know what it is all i know is when my kids get sent home with homework there are no instructions on how the hell they're supposed to get to the answer and when i start writing it out because it says show your work well when i show my work i write it out the way i've always written it out but you're right that is different from how i think about it when i'm doing the math in my head but when I'm showing my work, the, the kids are going, no, dad, that's not how we were taught. That's not how we do it. It's like, well, then I don't know what to tell you. I give you the answer, but I can't explain right. how I achieved that mentally. It's like I'm an idiot savant. Numbers flicked around in my head and then boom, I spit out the answer. Right. The, the Common Core math and, you know, I don't want to delve too deeply into the subject. Right. But Common Core math is all about breaking down the problem into things that you already know. Right. You know, if you did 36 times 12, you would say, okay, you know, I know 36 times 10 is 360 and I know two times 36 is 72. So I'll add those up and I'll get 432. Right. That's that's what Common Core math is about. It's about taking a a complex problem and breaking it out into simple things that you already know and then just putting it back together. Now, the the algorithm. Right also works and if you're writing it down it's faster right but that's not what we're trying to teach we're trying to teach an understanding of numbers as opposed to how to solve this specific problem yeah so all all that being said we're we're way off topic we were talking about the new ui and ue for the sts2 summit um so what's some stuff that you need to see in there right like what what are the things well you know I'm I'm excited. I heard uh, Jason was telling me that they're going to have the new ribbon format as far as menus go. So that's going to be a lot like regular modern software across the board. I mean, everything has a ribbon in it these days. 
So that kind of a menu setup is something I'm looking forward to. I'm curious to see how they uh, implement that, whereas right now you can build the UI how you want it. So does that mean we're going to be locked in with a very specific UI and you're going to need to adjust, or is it still going to be highly customizable? Um, that's going to be something Frankly, interesting. Frankly, even just the icon development, right? right. Like they, they went out and they hired a new icon graphical artist, right? That's a big deal because once you can make those buttons smaller, you can improve the the UI by, by taking those toolbars and not making them take up a ridiculous amount of screen real estate. Right. Um, right. And when I can fit everything into the top bar... Whereas right now I have a 4K and I'm using up three sides of it with buttons. So, right. you know, right. how much more real estate is that going to free up? And am I going to feel like, hey, I could fit two things on here now? Yeah. And I'm really hoping for a flyout feature. I love flyouts, uh, particularly things for like arcs where, all right, I need a separate button for a, a, a three point arc than I do for a start, center, end arc. Um, it's it's kind of stuff like that, like construction lines. Um, you know, one of the things I've always wished for, and maybe there's a way to do this, right? Um, but I, I want multimodal shortcuts. So like in AutoCAD, you can run a command that says, okay, when I press F5, do this series of commands, right? I would love the same thing for SES2, for instance, add a construction line, like start the construction line routine, and then put me into BSCL for my snap, oh, right? Because okay. that's the most common snap that I do. Um, but the one after that is, you know, auto point, right? Right. That's the second most common for me. Um, for some people, it would be intersection of construction lines. But whatever it is, I would much prefer to have a separate button to offset a line then I would create a new line. To me, those are distinct functions, and I would like distinct buttons on my keyboard to be able to do I that. I see. So you'd want one command that just puts you into offset construction line and another command that says, you know, auto point construction line or, or whatever else you want to say. Yeah, but the better solution to me, right, Like, because I'm always about let the users customize to them, is to allow you to run multiple commands in a row. I see. Okay. So it's basically two distinct command. It's, all right, get me into the mode that adds construction lines and then set my snap mode to BSCL. I got you. Uh, just, I don't know if that's something that they would be tending towards, but um, if you're using a gaming mouse and you've got it rigged up with the, the hotkeys that'll run a multi-key or a, a, a keystroke series of commands... Um, yep. that's how I have mine set up and yeah, you can have that where it'll, and I don't know what everyone else's buttons are, but I'm just going from my memory. CA is construction line ad, and then it'll, yep. it'll hit auto point or, um, I can have one set up for that. You know, but I have auto point offset construction line, offset member line vertex. Cause that for some reason comes up more often than I wish it would. Um, and, and uh, perpendicular, those are the ones that I, I absolutely use the most. So I have those all kind of pregame set up. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, that being said, the big thing is honestly uh, under the, the 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 new CEO Stuart Broom, right? We've seen consistent changes that have been asked for for years. To me, that's a really positive sign, right? The, the thing that we've got to watch out for that I, I know is going to happen is the minute that ribbon interface comes out, everybody, not everybody, half of the users are going to flip their lids. <laughs> They're absolutely going to lose it. They're going to hate it. And it, they'll, they'll just stick with whatever version was before the ribbon interface because they don't want to spend the time, invest the time to learn the new interface, right? And it really is, it's an investment because there's a reason every software in the world now has a ribbon interface. It's because they work, right? Right. Like it's not, it's, it's not just that they look good. Right, right. It's, it's, you know, Microsoft, when they first came out with it and AutoCAD, same thing, everybody's like, this interface is stupid. Well, here we are 10 years later. Right. And they're, 
they they work right you, you had to get used to it you had to figure out what was going on but it makes I a lot of sense i think that'll probably take two maybe three years for the vast majority of people to integrate over because i remember when 2015 came out and i was at that first user group conference and they said how many of you guys are using 2015 and it was like me and kurt app did raised our hands like we're out of 500 <laughs> people we're sitting around like maybe i should put my hand back down i'm sorry but in 2016 it was 50 50 then it got to be 2017 you know, so many people raised their hands, they went and asked the question backwards. All right, how many of you guys are using 7.3? And now you got the two or three guys, and, and the rest of us are like, well, if you're using 7.3, why are you here? Right. <laughs> well, and that's that really is the question, right? Because I assume most people who are using 7.3 are using it because they haven't paid their update fees. But if they're at yeah. the conference, that means they have they're, paid They're update. paid up, uh, yeah. Uh, they're, they're paid up. And you're still using, I mean, what at this point is what, 15-year-old software? Oh, God, I hope it's not that old. You're really making me feel ancient. But. It's it's at least 10 years old, right? Like, <laughs> Well, I mean, the last time 7.3 was really updated would have to be right around 2014, 2015. Because that's when 2015 came out. So. And it but had been around for a while. A lot of the people that, well, I didn't say a lot because there are only a few of them, but when I had spoken with a lot of the people that were just using 7.3, um, I want to say two out of three would say, I want to move forward, but it's not my choice. My customer or my boss won't let me upgrade. So it's bought and paid for, but we're not allowed to make use of it. And then the third guy was, you know, I like to pay my support fees because apparently I just want to be able to talk on the phone with uh, with Mark Lau all afternoon and, you know, waste his day. But no way in hell am I going to actually update. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a weird spot with the support fees. Right? It's I don't know. I've especially once you start getting up there in licenses. Right. Right. Like there really should be a sliding scale for support fees when you've got one versus when you've got five, because the more licenses we add, the less we use support because the five of us come together. Now we're at seven, right? There's there's seven of us. One of us knows the answer. The only time we ever go to support is when the software itself has failed. Right. Right. It has created a bug. And how how it's been explained to me is. They're just going through and deleting members until the problem goes away. Yes. Yes. Uh, and now that I have a, a better grasp of how they're accomplishing that, I even go through that process myself. So the last time we encountered that, um, and I was dealing, uh, I was talking with, I think it was with Mark, I was working on it. He's deleting members, I'm deleting members, and we both just kept working at it until one of us hit the hit the lotto and figured out which one it was, but... You know, yeah, it, right. it's a bad day when you've got a job with several thousand members on it. It's like, all right, I'll I'll let Mark do that. Sorry, buddy. Right. <laughs> right. Well, and it, it, people should know. Oh, I got I got my fly buddy down here. Let me get out of here. You. But you know, the other thing, as far as the fees go, and the way that they've uh, revised the explanation of it in recent years, is support is something that you're getting. But primarily what you're paying for now is the software development. And that's, I think, in 2019 when they pulled it back is why everybody lost their minds. Because it's like, well, am I paying for software updates and not getting them? Because then I think I should get my money back. Or am I paying for support? In which case, why am I paying taxes? You know, so that was sort of the, the split vote on that one. But... 2020 uh 2020 for sure came back around on that and hopefully 2021 continues that direction so one big thing that happened in 2020 i is that they added a haspless ability yes um, and the cool thing about the haspless ability is that if you install it, it takes it works haspless all the way back to 2018. So once you've installed the new license manager, 
you can go Haskless even on previous versions, uh, which is a big deal for us, particularly with our, you know, our, our cloud and stuff. Uh, you know, I talked to, to Steph because, and I was like, oh, I would have, I would have liked to catch that UI UE thing. And I was hoping to just play it back and nah, no, we're not going to, you know, we're not offering recordings of it. Oh, God. Like, this is something they, they constantly struggle with is we have this user group conference every year. This year they call it a summit. Right. And you get to the end of it and all the users are like, oh, I would have loved to see that, but I couldn't make it that day. Right. Sorry, you're just SOL. Yeah, yeah. Having a better ability to get that recorded and, and available, that should really be a library that people can access. Yeah. Because a lot of yeah. those and are a sort of a training, you know. There's a lot of different things on using parametrics or writing your own, um, which writing your own, that's a whole other level for a lot of people. But using the ones that come with it, everybody should learn how to use those. Those are amazing tools for what they are and they're there and most people don't know how to use them or even that they exist. Um, and then you've got even just, you know, the basic stuff. They used to have that whole beginner boot camp thing be an entry level programming or not programming, but an entry level training through starting a project and how to enter in simple members and just kind of how the whole interface works. I just checked out their YouTube channel. I was like, you know what, let me, let me just see. Maybe they did put the videos on, uh, on their YouTube channel and it's there's only one video and it's the introduction to the summit. Go. Oh, darn it. Well. Yeah. Such is life. So it gives us more things to make videos the, on in the future, I suppose. We'll do the training videos ourselves. Yeah. What about the market? What are you seeing? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Are we gonna go bankrupt before the end of this year? I mean it's always possible. Um it's been such a bipolar year. We thought that, you know, hey, everything's shutting down. We're going to go under. We need to we need to lay everybody off. And then five minutes later, it's like, you know what? We need to hire more people. We've got work coming in the door like crazy. I can't believe this because the rest of the world shut down. So all of a sudden, it's like we're operating in a protectionist uh, market and there's no offshore detailing. So we're buried to the hilt with big projects we've never seen before and just work 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 and we even got a job because a, a detailer passed away from getting covid and fell into our laps yeah, that that made this whole thing very real to me yeah right like it's like oh okay like this impacted somebody so desperately close to us right. um you know not personally right but Losing a, a detailer makes it feel like it could have been you. Exactly. So, so you know, we, we've seen that swing. And when you start to think about what kind of work have we been doing, it's it's all the uh, essential work. It's all bridges and hospitals has been, you know, the vast bulk I, of our work. I will say, though, construction individuals have a very easy route. Like, <laughs> every project has been declared essential. Yep. Right. Like every job, they're like, well, it's a restaurant. So clearly people need to eat essential construction. Let's let's go. I mean, OK. Yeah. I, me, I've so. seen some of the things you've been bidding on, and I was surprised that anyone would be going forward with some of those projects. But by and large, the, the stuff that we've been winning has been it's it's been federal projects. It's been bridge work, lots of bridge work. Uh, we've got some hospital work in there. Uh, do we have any schools? I'm trying to think. I don't think we had any schools. Nothing comes to mind. We usually have at least one school yeah. in the till, and we don't right now. But it, it's been a lot of that sort of work, and I don't know how much longer that's going to continue. I, I'm also seeing that the offshore market is coming back online, it seems like. I don't know if you get that same feeling, but... Uh, well, it's interesting you, you, you asked that because one of the users of our uh, cloud software, right, they just had the instance where their entire offshore team got COVID. Whole team. Oh. <laughs> so I don't know how, right, but they just switched teams. So all of a sudden it's like, hey, I need, I need new user credentials for all of these people because we got a whole new team. 
And I was like, um, okay. So, uh, you know, I set up the new user credentials, but... You know how hard we have to look to find a person to hire? They've got a team just standing by? Well, you got to imagine that their their unemployment looks a lot like ours, well, yeah, or worse, even. Fair. So that there, there may be people working in the wings... Or it might be one of these things where, you know, there's a large firm with 60, 70 detailers and, you know, one subdivision of it got COVID. So they lost 10 guys, but there's 10 other guys who got nothing to do. So. I got you. That could be. But, yeah, I didn't get too much into it. Um, they they said new, you know, new usernames. They got new usernames and one of the benefits of the cloud, right? Like, right, exactly. You know, when... When we needed to hire more people, we didn't have to say, oh, here's relocation expenses. Please come to sunny Rochester, New York. It was that would be the hardest sell ever. Yeah. (laughs) Stay wherever you are and just log in here instead of logging in there. Can you imagine trying to lure somebody to New York at this point? Well, at this point, or you probably four could, months ago because right? our right <laughs> four months ago, no, but but now our numbers are in the basement. Yeah. Well, it, and that's you know, that's got... also the funny thing too is anyone outside of New York considers the state of New York to be New York City. That's the whole thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, people be like, "Oh, where are you from?" And you say New York, and they're like, "Oh, so what's it like living in the city?" It's like I have no idea. Yep. Uh, I just pay their taxes. That's all. <laughs> Six hours away. I've never been. I just send them money every year. Um, so one of the interesting things that did come out of the summit that we actually did hear about uh, is that they have finally, right, finally added the the moment connection at the top of a column. Yes. Shared <laughs> I cannot wait. moment cap plate at the top of a column that will adjust itself to be an L or a T or a cross for two, three, or four connections. Oh, yeah, we've been telling customers for a while, we're just going to run that column up an yep. inch. That's just been the workaround. Yep, just that's that's what we're doing. And none of them really complain because it's still under the deck. It doesn't matter, right? You, it's The bolt heads are going to stick up through it anyways. Uh, we had one customer complain and he was like, I don't know why we'd ever do that. Like it, it sticks into the deck. And I'm like, yeah, but so do all the bolts. Like what's the... Right. The, the moment what's plate the is up above... The top of steel. Right. And then once right. you add the bolts as well, those are above that. So what's right. your problem? And not to mention, you know, if it's fillet welded, it's but Right. The other thing, I don't know if you saw the illustration. Um, we have run into this a couple of times in our career. I don't know if it's a regional thing that sees it more often, but uh, you got an HSS column. It goes up. It hits a plate. So it's stopped. You have a grade 50 plate, and then you have a little bit more column, and then you have another grade 50 cap plate on top of that, and then your fillet well, or you're not fillet, your uh, bevel groove w- welding to both of those plates from the beam flanges. Sure. That looks like that's going to be a thing as well. And right. that's it's like a through, it's like a through plate tipped on its side. Kind of, yeah. And uh, that's something that when you have to do one of those, sucks the life out of you. Because that is just graphical city in order to manipulate that all to get it to work you've got to trim the actual column down then you've got to model back in all those pieces system won't do any of that and to see that that is going to be something that just happens oh right and it's funny because it's not the time it actually takes to model it in it's the time it takes your brain to accept that there's no way around exactly. modeling this in. Right. How many different ways can I think <laughs> about selling a, an engineer on not doing this, please? Right. Let's, yeah. And then the, well, I'll do that in a minute. Let's just browse the internet for a minute. And then <laughs> I'll delete that material, trim it, make it graphical, all of that stuff. Like it's, it's really not the actual time. It's, there's this overhead thing that i can't really properly explain but that definitely exists yep Uh, the hatred of graphically modeling connections especially slightly complicated ones right right ones that could be made differently but for some reason the engineer has decided that despite this entire body of knowledge that says do it this way and hundreds of years (laughs) of experience that they know better 
So, you know, it's the same engineers who are still specifying through plates for all of their shear connections at tubes. Oh, I, I know what to do here. <laughs> you kind yeah, of want to find who taught them that in college and choke that person. So don't even put that idea in their heads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just delete it from the manual as even an option. Just I get the purpose nope, of through plates, but just tell them, hey, you got to have to use a thicker column. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, they tried that. They tried that with W8s. They were like, stop using W8 columns. You know what the most column or common column size is? W8, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> they, it just, they, they can't get engineers to look past the material, the, the weight. Right. No matter how hard they try. And well, it, it's all I need. To be, right. In, in, you know, in consideration of the engineers, the fabricators are just as bad. Right. Right. 90% of fabricators are doing a weight takeoff and then adding labor on top of it. And, you know, they've got these price per pound, man. Well, I, I can't even say price per pound, but it, it kind of is right. Like they, they add up the material costs. They're not giving a credit for the fact that, you know, they they did extra work to to make the moment connection simple. It's uh, OK. A moment connection costs fifteen hundred bucks times thirty five moment connections or, you know, whatever else their formula is. It's. It's 0.5 man hours per four bolts or something. Whatever it happens to be. It's all dull nonsense. <laughs> well, welcome to structural steel estimating where the prices are made up <laughs> and the weight doesn't matter. It's all guesswork. You know, I still remember uh, it was a couple of years ago you were working on a, a fairly substantial takeoff. And oh, you're going to piss me you, off with this story because I know exactly the one you're telling. So you got through with it and you're like, man, you know, I, this is a bet the company size job. I don't want to be singly responsible for this. So I'm going to get mad involved, too. That way he can share the blame if we go down in flames over this. So you have me do a takeoff and you don't show me any of your numbers and you just say, do a takeoff. We're going to compare at the end. And so we start reading through, and it's page by page we're reading off numbers. And you've got something, and I've got something, and we are wildly different. Every single page. We hardly agree anywhere. We get to the end, and we tallied to within $100 of each other. <laughs> Screw it. Send it in then, I guess. No, I, th I thought you were going to tell. I spent... We, we got this, this was when I was doing actual steel estimating, not detailing estimating. Oh, okay. We got this big project into bid, and for whatever reason, we were way behind the eight ball. And it's, all right, take it home, work overtime, spend your whole weekend on this project, get me an estimate. You know, a couple million pounds of steel, and we need it in three days. So I take it home, I, I, I do the takeoff, I spend the entire three days. And I said, okay, you know, all right, Mr. Owner, it's 1,760,853 pounds of steel. And he says, okay, 2 million pounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I was not aware of that one. <laughs> yeah, yep. I... I could have done that in an hour. I could have told you it's about two million pounds in an hour. <laughs> uh, what are you doing? Well, you know, they're not around anymore. So, yep, and there's a good reason for that. So. All right, guys, I think that wraps it up for this episode of the Steel Forum. We'll get some more out to you, too, and we got some quick tips coming up. And uh, as always, we hope you hit those like and subscribe buttons. For some reason, we're supposed to say that. We'll see you next time here on the Steel Forum.